जय राधा कुंज भी हरे जय हरा कुंज भी हा हे है जय गोपी जन वेरी वर दिए है गोपी जय गोपी जन वेरी वर दिए है गोपी सौरनंदन भज जन हंझनंदन भज जन हंझनायस जमून थीरा भान छमून थी जमून थीरा भान छमून थी हे झाइरा माधवा कुंज बिहा हे हे झाइरा माधवा कुंज बिहा हे हय गोपी जन वेरी वर धोपी जन गेरी अझैया गोपी जन वेरी वर धिया सौरनंदन भज जन हंझनंदन भज जन हंझनायमून थीरा भान छमून जमून थीरा भान छी जमून झैरा माधवाम कुंज बिहा हे झय कुंजा भी हे झायरा माधवा झय घौरानी था हे घोरानी था हे घोरानी था झाय घोरानी था घोरानी था घोरानी था झाय घो बबू था 
है प्रभु है प्रभु पान जाए प्रभु पान प्रभु जय जय प्रभु शील प्रभु पाद की जय हरि नाम शांकीर्तन की जय श्रीमद भागवत की जय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय so we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, 8th Canto, Chapter 12. Mohini Murti bewilders Lord Shiva. We're doing verses 17 through, and the first purport is in 21. Okay. Sri. <coughs> Sri Sukha Uvacha Iti Bruvano Bhaga Iti Bruvano Bhagavams Tatradvatara Diyata Sarvatas Charayams Chaksur Baba Aste Samomaya Sri Sukha Uvacha Iti Bruvano Bhagavams Tatraivatra Radhyata Sarvatas Charayams Chaksur Bhava Aste Samohamaya Sri Sukha Uvacha Iti Bruvano Bhagavams Tatraivata Radhyata Sarvatas Charayams Chaksur Bhava Aste Samohmaya Sri Sukha Uvacha, Sri Sukha Dev Goswami said, Iti, thus, Bruvana, while speaking, 
Bhagavan, Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Tatra, there, Eva, immediately, Antaradiyata, disappeared from the vision of Lord Shiva and his associates. Sarvata, everywhere. Charayan, moving. Chaksu, the eyes. Baba, Lord Shiva. Aste, remained. Saha Umaya, with his wife Uma. Mm. So, now we're going to get a summary from Sukadeva Goswami of just what happened. <coughs> Sri Sukadeva Goswami continued, After speaking this way, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu immediately disappeared and Lord Shiva remained there with Uma, looking for him all around with moving eyes. Mm -hmm. Verse number 18. There in a nice forest nearby full of trees with reddish pink leaves and varieties of flowers, Lord Shiva saw a beautiful woman playing with a ball. Her hips were covered with a shining sari and ornamented with a belt. Hmm. Because the ball was falling down and bouncing up, as she played with it, her breasts trembled, and because of the weight of those breasts and her heavy flower garland, her waist appeared to be be at appear to be all but breaking at every step as her two soft feet which were reddish with coral moved here and there hmm. the woman's face was decorated by broad beautiful restless eyes which moved as the ball bounced here and there from her hand the two brilliant earrings on her ears decorated her shiny cheeks like bluish reflections and the hair scattered on her face made her even more beautiful to see. As she played, okay, this is translation of number 21. As she played with the ball, the sari covering her body became loose and her hair scattered. She tried to bind her hair with her beautiful left hand. And at the same time, she played with the ball by striking it with her right hand. This was so attractive that the Supreme Lord, by his internal potency in this way, captivated everyone. Srila Prabhupada's purport. In Bhagavad Gita 7.14, it is said, Daiviesha gunamayi mamamaya doratyaya. The external potency of the Supreme Personality of God is, very, is extremely strong. Indeed, everyone is fully captivated by her activities. Lord Sam, Shambhu, Shiva, was not to be captivated by the external potency, but because Lord Vishnu wanted to captivate him also, he exhibited his internal potency to act the way that his external potency acts to captivate ordinary living entities. And that's a key statement there. Here, I'll read it again. Lord Shiva was not to be captivated by his external potency, but because Lord Vishnu wanted to captivate him also, he exhibited his internal potency to act the way that his external potency acts to captivate ordinary living entities. Lord Shiva can captivate, um, Lord Vishnu can captivate anyone, even such a strong personality as Lord Shambhu. Umagyan Timirandasya. Ganajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurudevena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaudamani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu pe bacha bhadita nam bhavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhaktivindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare 
So Lord Shiva became curious because all the demigods get this, got to see this unique and most amazing form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in a form of a very attractive woman. Lord Shiva wanted to see it also. Uh, Lord Vishnu, it's explained that Lord Vishnu was thinking, you don't want to see this. <laughs> but Shiva was insistent. And as it's described in some of the previous purports, uh, Shiva was thinking, well, she appeared when the demigods were there, and the demigods didn't, you know, they were okay, apparently. So I'm the chief of all the demigods, so I can't be, I'm not going to be bewildered by any beautiful form of a woman. But Vishnu wanted to do something extra. So as I mentioned here, he wanted to captivate Lord Shiva. So he put a little extra, or what we say, Shakti in this one. <laughs> yeah, he has unlimited Shakti. <laughs> and um, this time he, it, it appeared in the same way that the non-devotees and materialists get attracted to the external environment so, but it wasn't. It was actually the internal potency of the Supreme Lord acting in, in that way. And you'll see as, as the uh, verses continue on how Lord Shiva becomes bewildered by that. So, I guess the main point in here is that the, the power of the external potency is so strong that it keeps everyone captivated under the idea that there is happiness in this material world wherein Krishna emphasizes at least twice in the Bhagavad Gita, Dukalayama Sasratama Nitya Asubam, he says that this material energy is, uh, it's simply meant for your suffering. <laughs> no matter what form the external energy appears to be in, it has a dual uh, apparent nature, and that apparent nature is that Whatever apparent happiness you're looking for, you also get in the concomitant suffering from that same thing. People don't know this. They always look for the happiness. Why do the, ex why do the living entities always look towards the external energy for happiness? Because one of the reasons why, and there's two reasons, one is maya presents itself in that way as being something attractive, something that can give happiness. But the other thing is, by nature, the living entities are ananda. They ha they want happiness. It's their nature. So they look. So try to fulfill that nature to find happiness. They project that nature onto the external energy, which is not there. And therefore, people wind up becoming disappointed, frustrated, suicidal. The whole list of negative reactions are unlimited. Is there any happiness in the material world? Uh, Vyapati, in his poetry, says there is. And Prabhupada also confirms that there is a happiness in this material world. But what is that happiness? He says, family life. But then he, he qualifies that happiness by saying, it's a drop in the desert. <laughs> As a living entity wants unlimited happiness or continual happiness, that is not to be found in this world, either continual or unlimited, or you might even say something that is satisfactory. So the living entity will accept so kind of suffering, all kinds of suffering, just like going into the desert is a form of suffering <laughs> because there's nothing in the desert. <laughs> that can give you any relief. So why you, why would you go into a desert? Well, obviously, you shouldn't have been there in the first place. <laughs> it's not meant for the human being to live. I mean, there are desert people who live there, but, but they're just a little bit better than the animal species, not much in terms of their mentality and their lifestyle. So a person in the desert will find that the water is not there. And we'll look for water. And because of the desire to have water becomes strong, due to the, the uh, thirst becomes very strong also, one projects 
due to the reflections of the sun onto the sand, there appears to be some happiness or some water. And it looks like there is a reservoir of water, but all it is is a reflection of the sun off the sand. And the, and the mind projects it in that way. And what happens? One tries to find, and what do they get? More burning sand, that's all it is. So um, if someone comes up to you and says, my dear sir, you are suffering from lack of water, here, I have one drop for you. <laughs> you should drink it to your full satisfaction. I think you would be a little bit upset with that person, <laughs> kind of just making fun of you or teasing you, because one drop can't satisfy you. It just in exasperates or increases the desire for, for water. So in the same way, Maya somehow or other gives the living entities a little bit of relief from suffering at times, and, they, and this is what is called happiness, and just to keep them going in their pursuit to find happiness. So you, you, look, you get a drop here, and you get a drop there, and then you get another drop, and then you drop, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> And then they remember you for, for all the effects you had about trying to find that one drop. <laughs> when you're young, you don't believe any of this stuff. <laughs> you think it's all, you know, it's just nice stuff, the philosophy, you know, and Krishna's just talking to the old people. <laughs> but actually, no, he's talking to everybody, all living entities. But when you're young, you can't give up this desire to find happiness in this world. So even if, you know, somebody tells you directly there isn't any, you still won't believe them and until you actually experience it. <laughs> uh, just like we see what to speak about uh, youth, out of all the different ages of a human being, the most frustrating age is the teenage age. <laughs> And that's when people have so many desires to, to find success, happiness, they're always making plans. And that is indicated by that the amount of suicides in the world are categorized according to different age groups. And the biggest age group for suicide is those in the teenage years. <laughs> and that's, and that's, that's a, that is a fact, I mean, it's been recorded. So um, it gives you the indication that there's no happiness. But what presents itself as the other ultimate happiness is, um, what is it, Maitunya Bhava, or the shackles of sex life. Uh, what is that verse? Uh, yeah, that's, I was thinking of one by Shrishabdev, 5.8. That's the first verse, number eight. Number eight is uh, the uh, attraction between Pumsa. Yeah, that's it. You got it. You want to say it? Yeah. Mohan, 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 that this apparent. And as it says, misconception, the attraction for male and women in the material world is a misconception. Because the living entity is actually attracted only to Krishna. <laughs> and what is that attractive feature? And Prabhupada describes a very nice story. This was something he wrote in the Back to Godhead magazines in the very early days before he actually started his Krishna conscious movement in the West. He tells one story. And he titles it Truth and Beauty. Um, truth and Beauty. Uh, is truth beautiful? Yes, but what is actually truth? If something is not truth, it appears to be truth, it may not be beautiful. So the story goes that there was one prince, young prince, and he was riding through the kingdom and he comes to a little hermitage. He doesn't notice this hermitage is here after being in his kingdom for a while, but he's curious, so he knocks on the door just to see who lives there, and a beautiful young girl opens the door. 
he's immediately mesmerized by her physical attractions and he can't think of anything else but marrying this girl. <laughs> so he's the prince, he has some arrogance because of his position, so he makes a proposal. And she's chaste, she's simple, she's not interested. But she knows his position, so rather than trying to, you know, argue with him, she's, she realizes there's only one way to convince him. She said, yes, I will accept you, but you come back after one week and I'll be ready for your, you know, proposal. He's, he's all excited. You know, he's kicking his heels up, he's jumping on his horse, he's doing backflips, he's, he's, he's all kinds of fired up. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> and he gets on his horse and he's, he's just counting, the, there's 168 hours in the week, so he's counting every second of every hour. <laughs> and he uh, finally, you know, he's getting to that time. And during that time, she decides to give him a little lesson. So she uh, takes these strong laxatives and purgatives and she starts passing stool and urine and vomiting. But what she does, she collects it in buckets and keeps it in big buckets in the back room of her house. And now, you know, she's a little bit different in, you know, her color is a little bit gone and she's somewhat emaciated. <laughs> So now he comes and he, uh, you know, he, he, this is the final moment, you know, he's at, a, he's at the height of his, you know, happiness. <laughs> and he knocks on the door and she opens the door and he says, I, I, excuse me, ma'am, could you tell that long, young lady that lives here that I've come? <laughs> and she says to him, that's me. <laughs> he says, no, that's not you. You're not that lady. Tell that lady. No, that's me. You don't recognize me? No, it can't be you. You're very much interested in my beauty. So I saved my beauty for you. So please come back and I'll give it to you wholesale, free of charge. <laughs> So she leads him into the back room, and there's all the nice buckets with all the beautiful substances that make up this wonderful contour and shape, which is called the human form. <laughs> so you, it's actually caricatures, and in this way you'll see drawings of this, and he's practically falling over in disgust, and she's laughing. <laughs> so, so Prabhupada tells that, yes, Truth is actually beauty, but what is real truth? <laughs> so what is the human body? Blood, pus, urine, stool, bone, marrow, feces, what else, what other stuff you got in there? Various kinds of aromas that are so nice that you have to buy perfume in order to cover them. So it's, you know, the human body is just so full of so many nice ingredients. But then you think, well, you know, there's that nice skin on the top. Take a look under a microscope and you'll see something different. Because there's little worms that run around in the skin. You can't see them. And they eat all the bacteria in the skin to keep the skin fresh. So if you look under the skin in a microscope, you actually see the skin for what it actually is. So there you go, that's the full package, Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is what is the, the, there was one devotee, he would say, you know, he was like staunch brahmachari. He said, when I see a form of a woman, I simply see the skeleton. That's all I see. After a while he got married. <laughs> Married the skeleton plus, you know, he got a little extra besides that too. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was a beautiful skeleton. Had, everything was shaped so nicely. The skull was completely round and all the bones were properly in place. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is, a, so this is a good meditation. Jai Shisi Panchatattva Ki Jai.
So uh, yeah, what this is this is Maya. So what appears to be so you know attractive is something actually else. But what makes the body attractive? The presence of the soul. As soon as the soul has left the body, the body just turns into something else, and it takes on its actual composition and starts to deteriorate. And Prabhupada said, there is a nice, beautiful girl, but now she is no, no longer living, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. Yeah. So this is the infatuation of the external energy which bewilders everyone. And about how here, now Krishna adds a little bit of Shakti to his potency to give, make sure that Shiva gets a nice lesson. And so Shiva, and, but Prabhupada says, you know, Lord Shiva, we shouldn't find fault with Lord Shiva. We shouldn't find fault with Lord Shiva. If Lord Shiva, was, as Prabhupada said, he is all right. <laughs> He is all right. That's the words Prabhupada uses. But he's, um, Krishna wanted to make a point. And what is that? The Bhagavatam is for us. The Bhagavatam is for us. That The power of the external energy, which is less than the power of the internal energy, is so powerful that it can appear to bewilder even Lord Shiva. And we have an example of Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan when Krishna wanted to make that same point when the cowherd boys ran into the mouth of Agasura when that Agasura demon was trying to allure the cowherd boys and Krishna into his mouth to kill them. The cowherd boy, Krishna somehow or other appears to be diverted from what's happening and the cowherd boys run into the mouth. And in that particular narration, the Acharyas mentioned that when Krishna saw that the cowherd boys had run into the mouth of Agasura, he became bewildered. <laughs> and, but how can Krishna become bewildered? He can't. So this is again some indication of a particular Leela, which just wants to enhance the Leela, but at the same time, it is teaching the conditioned souls that this material energy is uh, meant to trap you in different ways, so you can try to enjoy in different ways. Because there is a class of people who think that there's nothing in this material energy that is enjoyable. But they don't take up spiritual life in a, in a real way. And they remain in a very marginal and very, what we say, what's the word? Uh, it's a kind of like a dichotomy. It's more like a situation that doesn't have any happiness anywhere. So they live on aversion. They live on aversion. But as as the Shastras explain very clearly, and the Acharyas give the understanding that simply aversion to the external energy uh, leads to again attraction to that same external energy. <laughs> on due course of time and it's a type of attachment also and therefore one is remaining entangled in the material energy so one has to get attacked, attracted to Krishna in Vrindavan <laughs> not as Mohini Murti and Maharaj wasn't here for that class I gave the other day on the same subject but I was giving a class I'll tell the pastime again in Mumbai and I was talking about this pastime, and one, two brahmacharis were there, and they, they both practically chimed in together to ask me a question. And the question was, should should we go to the GBC and establish our, our request to have a Mohini Murti installed in our temples <laughs> so we can have that worship? Because it is an authorized form of the Lord. It's the Lord appeared in that form. And my immediate response was, I don't think there'll be any brahmachari ashrams left in the, in ISKCON. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't think that was a good idea, and I don't. I think everybody agreed with me. <laughs> so yeah, so this is what goes on in, you know, trying to sneak around the external energy to find some kind of happiness, <laughs> but you can't do that. So Krishna in Vrindavan is all attractive, and that type of attraction 
it brings your consciousness to its perfectional stage of happiness and unlimited knowledge. And then that happiness is continually expanding more and more as we hear and focus on Krishna and Sri Vrindavan. And that is what Srila Prabhupada has been giving us. He mentions that in the, the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. He says, out of all the forms of the Lord as he manifests, we should develop our attractions for, for Vrindavan Krishna and worship that, that form of the Lord as our Istadev, because that is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, principle that he teaches Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham. So no one can break attraction, but one has to be attracted to the right thing, and that is to Krishna. So as we mentioned in a previous class, no one can break the attraction to the external energy. I can philosophically, and so many other persons, great souls, can philosophically talk about the illusion in maya, but you will still be attracted to maya unless you become attracted to Krishna. <laughs> Until you develop that strong attraction to Krishna, and you cannot overcome this power of Maya, because Maya is so strong. And if you think, well, I'm okay, <laughs> good luck, because <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> you, Because uh, material energy will appear to you in such a way that you will be bewildered. That's the power of material energy. Uh, you think I'm okay, but <laughs> so never. No one should ever feel safe in thinking that I'm okay. Always, one should be very cautious and continuously take shelter of the Lord and pray for His mercy and His protection against the allurements. And there's where Lord Nishringadev fits into our our worship. Lord Nishringadev. Those who seriously worship Lord Nishringadev or regularly worship Lord Nishringadev, he gives the power to overcome, or he gives you the understanding to overcome the attractive force of the external energy. Lord Nishringadev is especially geared for that. Bhakti Vinod Thakur in his prayers to Lord Nishringadev glorifies Lord Nishringadev for that feature. He helps one see through or not become bewildered by the external forms in this material world. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, if you're attracted to anything in this material world, whatever it is, it will cause you to come back again to try to fulfill that attraction. <laughs> Prabhupada said, even one sweet ball. <laughs> even one sweet ball will cause you to in other words, you may eat sweets, but doesn't mean you become attracted to it, and you've got to have it if you don't get it. So that's the difference. It's not like if you eat sweets, you're attracted to sweets. That doesn't, no, it doesn't mean. But if one cannot live without it, or seeks different opportunities to fulfill it, then that's the attachment. Okay, so we'll stop here. Any questions? Comments? Uruga, you have a question? No? Okay. Oh, Mataji has a question? Okay. Thank you, Maharaj, for this class. Um, as you were speaking about the Brahmachari Ashram and, of course, this story about truth and beauty, I was just thinking that uh, how will we have any Grihastha Ashram if everybody thought that? And how would we have any future generation of ISKCON devotees if everybody became Brahmachari and Brahmacharini? There's no loss. <laughs> You mean to say, if everybody remains in the celibate ashram, there'll be no iskan? What are you kidding? We'll be very powerful iskan. <laughs> Much more powerful. 
Prabhupada said in one, in one talk, he said, all the men should remain brahmachari and all the women should get married. <laughs> said that. And then he looked at the leaders and he said, it's up to the leaders to figure out how to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, there are many spiritual movements where there are no grihastas. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, there's no loss. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.